Support Wrestle Talk. Give us a subscribe. Now more than ever, it seems important to laugh. And what's funnier than all these very important men in the tiniest of pants? Or this man dressed as a king, throwing your college boyfriend to his death because he once sat in his chair? Or a genuine Olympian dressing like a background extra in a Scooby-Doo basketball movie? Ribs tickled. As much as we like to look back on the TV 14 decade of WWE programming as more entertaining because wrestlers were allowed to give each other brain damage and say poo and dick and the like, I'd actually like to make the case for modern wrestling having its fair share of laughs per square wrestler. This is not to say that the PG decade was funny by the standards of an actual comedy or even a duffel bag full of baked beans with half a dog hidden inside. It's just that in the last 12 years of the modern era, without as many easy options or targets, family-friendly WWE actually had to make jokes. Not all of them worked, but hey, turns out I found way more than I thought I would. Here are the 20 funniest moments of WWE's modern era. Number 20, Chris Jericho plays Price is Right. For a full goddamn calendar year, WWE invited celebrities to guest host Raw to help draw interest. Look, WWE would say, it's Jeremy Piven. Is this what you want? We've forgotten how to do Raw. Please applaud the Piven. Most of the time it was a real summer fest of bollocks, but Bob Barker was amazing. In 2009, he came on and hosted a Price is Right segment, which featured hapless comedy P Brain, Santino and Jillian, IRS, nice touch, and a saving grace, Chris Jericho, who makes the whole thing work because he's just so cross that it's happening. Also, he's topless and wearing a huge name tag with Chris on it. On paper, this segment should have died, but the interplay between Jericho and Barker, who spends the entire time talking to Y2 Jay like he's six, made it the best guest host segment of a very rough year. Number 19, Rusev Day. WWE's refusal to make Rusev a main eventer is one of the great mysteries of our time, along with the Loch Ness Monster and the endurance of Pitbull. Right up until WrestleMania 31, everything was, like Rusev himself, looking great, but then he very slowly fell off a cliff. Despite setbacks, Rusev constantly added weird and wonderful little touches to his character, like stealing a monitor at the 2016 Royal Rumble and declaring himself television champion. His masterpiece however, was Rusev Day, a wonderfully demented running joke where every single day was Rusev Day, and that may not sound funny to you if you haven't seen it, but the sheer relentlessness of the bit became this absurd marvel and Rusev got super over, and now he's released. And that's the real punchline, isn't it? Number 18, Biggie's hips. I think it was Professor Shakira of Columbia University who said, I'm on tonight, you know my hips don't lie, open brackets, no fighting, close brackets, and I'm starting to feel it's right. All the attraction, the tension, don't you see baby, this is perfection. Biggie's hips are like that, a churning thrash of meat and raw sexual excellence. Half the time it seems Biggie isn't even in control of his flanks and that maybe the real Biggie died years ago and he's just been piloted by some crazed alien pelvis who's attempting world domination via some sort of gyrating mind control and it's working. Number 17, Kyle O'Reilly dies. Kyle O'Reilly is one of the low-key best comedians in NXT history. While there's nothing overtly funny in his gimmick, i.e. what would happen if Mark Zuckerberg knew Taekwondo, he's had some really funny moments over the years like doing air guitar or this face, but the best has to be at TakeOver New Orleans when an author of pain, there's no telling which one, gave O'Reilly a German suplex. Riley rolls through and it looks like he's going to hulk up, but then he faints and falls backwards out of the ring, out of shot. It's a perfect little moment of almost Buster Keaton quality physical comedy. Number 16, CM Punk on commentary. Did you know that once upon a time, CM Punk wasn't just a chant fans used to say, nah, none of this, but an actual real life wrestler. It's true. Not only was he good in the ring, but he was an exceptional talker on a few random occasions in 2010, including a full month on Raw while he was recuperating from a hip injury, Punk was on commentary duty. He was very funny, mocking Vince's what a maneuver call from the 90s, relentlessly bagging on Michael Cole and for his stint on an episode of NXT season 3 back when it was a god awful talent show, his commentary was a blistering and hilarious takedown of not just the show, but everyone in the ring, Josh Matthews and the WWE system in general. Number 15, Owens destroys Michael Cole, as CM Punk proved if you're a charismatic anti-hero, there is no greater target on God's green earth than Michael Cole. What would happen if you drew a soul patch on a yogurt? Perhaps the cruelest wrestler to storm the coal mine was Kevin Owens. Michael Cole occasionally is called upon to record quiet, sit-down interviews with stars for WWE.com, which he's actually really good at doing. He's a fantastic straight man, and every time he's interviewed Kevin Owens, it's been beautiful. The interview after Kevin Owens won the Universal Championship is especially good with, look, sure, be a star, but Owens asking, how are you, Michael? Then as soon as he starts 
starts to answer saying, I don't care, is a lot funnier than it should be. It also ends with Owens kicking Michael out of his own interview. And there's not much I can say to sell how funny it is. Just seek it out for yourself. Number 14, he's Slater in the Rumble. He's got kids and, well, that joke is a lot sadder these days. The 2018 Men's Rumble remains probably the best Rumble match of the 2010s. It's a butcher's pantry of sterling beef cuts all jostling for the purpose of A, going to WrestleMania, B, hugging in the corner and C, pissing on Heath Slater's dreams. In a genuinely wonderful through line, Heath Slater is assaulted by Baron Corbo before he reaches the ring and he doesn't make it into the ring over the next five entries as each entrance sparks him out on their way down the ramp, apart from Big E, who force feeds him pancakes he kept in his taint, which is worse. Finally, Seamus, full of big dickhead energy, cockily picks Slater off the floor, throws him into the ring, where Slater immediately eliminates him to a monster pop. It's a pure joy and the kind of character work and careful setup and punchline you don't expect from WWE. Number 13, The Rock talks to young Cena. Definitely the best feud between a boob tattoo and a breakfast cereal WWE ever did. The build up to the first Rock versus Cena match was genuinely great, with both men sinking their teeth into each other in a way that felt actually quite damaging in places. John Cena called Rock out and his Brahma bullshit about loving WWE even though he don't even go here and Rock slapped the taste out of Cena's corny corporate shilling. There are better promos in the feud but the funniest is The Rock talking to essentially the Animal Crossing avatar of John Cena, a small boy in Cena cosplay. Rock dunks on him so much he makes the boy cry and even as he comforts him the burns continue. We all watched your awful movies and you don't see us crying. Number 12, the Iconics rule WWE.com. Yay, the Iconics are back. That's great because while they may not be perhaps horsewoman level between the ropes, their gimmick may have been genuinely the funniest in recent memory. The whole thing is basically they're loud jerks, which may not seem revolutionary in the world of wrestling, but when they were left to improvise in WWE.com exclusives, aka the actually good promo wing of the WWE, their interview style was similar to a swarm of seagulls descending on a drop sausage. I'm not going to butcher their work without a context quote, so just look up their promo after being eliminated from the 2019 Rumble, and then look up more promos, and then join me over in the online Iconics fan forums. It's really weird over here. Number 11, Braun Strowman and his comedy murders. Even though Braun Strowman is still regularly appearing on our screens, God, I miss Braun Strowman so much. I don't want modern Braun, universal champion Braun. I want my Braun. The one who flipped over ambulances, screamed, I'm not finished with you, in one of the most genuinely hilarious prolonged backstage brawls WWE have ever committed to film, and it almost pains me to look back, who tried to murder Brock Lesnar and Roman Reigns with a grappling hook. With a grappling hook, friends. I miss him every day, but as Dr. Seuss said, don't cry because it's over. Smile because a giant nipple bear tried to murder Brick Lozenge with Batman tactics. Number 10, Seamus and Beaker. They really tried to make Seamus funny. Remember Dahl 1800 fella? Wish I didn't. However, after the Muppets successfully managed to improve A Christmas Carol, Treasure Island, and Jason Siegel with their presence, they pulled off the Herculean feat of making Shamo do a funny. On an episode of Raw where the Muppets are hosting, Seamus runs across Beaker backstage, and in a moment almost too fated to be true, it was revealed that Seamus and the tube of pork luncheon meat with a ginger tuft were, of course, related. Tell Auntie Teresa I said hello, Seamus says, while fixing Beaker's hair. Actually, quite heartwarming. Is there anything that can't be improved with Muppets? Number nine, the Festival of Friendship. Kevin Owens is very funny. Chris Jericho is very funny. The team of Chris Jericho and Kevin Owens was the stuff that dreams were made of. The Commedia del Canada duo had many highlights, especially murdering Tom Phillips live on air during the Survivor Series 2016 pre-show, but the Festival of Friendship beats all. Y2J, with the barely concealed desperation of someone trying to save a relationship they know is over, presents KO with a series of gifts, including an erotic statue, an erotic painting, a thankfully non-erotic magician, and f***ing Gilberg, all while KO pout. It's actually better than the Rock Mankind This Is Your Life segment and ends with a moment of genuine heartbreak segment of the year easy. Number eight, the bros awaits. You know that old stereotype of someone getting really drunk, grabbing the closest random person at the party, hugging them tightly and saying, you're my best friend. No one else gets me. You really see me. You know, you're my best friend. The bros awaits are like that, but you know, in the daylight. Matt Riddle and Pete Dunn might look like the cover stars for the asylum version of Pineapple Express, but murder idiot and his grumpy sister are actually an inspired pairing that have somehow been given free reign to make a series of oddly absurdist insider promo about their magical friendship. Their road to take over Portland was definitely the best use of a golf cart in wrestling since WrestleMania X7. And God, we really need to get those two men back in the same room because I hate to say it, but Matt Riddle and Timothy Thatcher, they're not the bros awaits. Number seven, R-Truth undeclaring for the Rumble. I, right, okay, I, I can say it. Let me get there. I think R-Truth 
is really funny. Like, yes, now, okay, look, I know that for the longest of times I hated the man because he seemed to inherit Santino's crown of nonsense pratfalling irritant, but his work with the 24-7 championship, it wore me down. Our truth is really good. Maybe he'll unblock me now. His segment declaring, then undeclaring for the rumble cracked the lobster up so much that Brock actually pitched more ideas to work with truth. And I didn't know that Brock was capable of laughing at something that hadn't been executed in a forest. Number six, Miz and Miz Dow. You've probably heard me talk about Miz Dow enough, but how does it not make the list? Damon Sandow being hired as a stunt double for the Miz and that evolving into dressing like the A-lister and copying all of his moves, including and especially all the times Miz would get beat down and sh** canned. Thank you, Damien Sandow. I'm welcome. Number five, Miz and Maurice are John Cena and Nikki Bella. It was around 2016 when the Miz finally did evolve from long-term employee to actual legend. Maurice became a full-time part of his act, which was a giant upgrade. The A-lister gimmick was getting better and better with each passing month. And after a year of shoulder injuries and heartbreak, seeing all their favorite wrestlers being put on the shelf, people finally started to respect a man who'd been able to use character work rather than risky offense to keep himself relevant. Miz elevated his stock throughout 2016 enough to earn him a match with John Cena and the feud, which yes, really only existed to plug the Total Bellas TV show and you know, that whole proposal thing was oddly wonderful with Miz and Maurice doing Cena and Nikki cosplay and mocking their borderline inhuman relationship in ways that were equal parts Randy Savage and Randy Hilarious. I didn't know I needed Miz as John Cena, but now I've got it, I'm not letting it go. Number four, the fashion files. Fandango and Tyler Breeze are the handsomest tag team in the history of the world. And in a way that really doesn't seem fair, they're also one of the funniest. I, I really I hate them. They had really good comedy matches, like the one where Tyler Breeze wrestled as a janitor for some reason, but their backstage skits, The Fashion Files, are the closest WWE ever came to replicating naked gun magic, and that includes the time they had Leslie Nielsen searching for The Undertaker. That bit where they ran down all of the Usos' crimes, ending with, that's jaywalking, and that's Jimmy walking. There, there are playlists online watch them, watch them all. Number three, Team Hell No Therapy. One thing people often forget about the rise of Daniel Bryan is that it grew out of Team Hell No. Bryan started to believe he was the weak link in the team and that drove him harder, better, faster, stronger. And one of the reasons fans got behind Daniel Bryan on this hot streak was that they spent the last year getting to know Bryan as a performer through the astonishingly good anger management therapy storyline he and Kane had gone through in the summer of 2012. Accompanied by the best backstage non-wrestler in the history of the business, Dr. Shelby, the two men took part in skit, after skit that included movie references, deep dives into ridiculousness of Kane's backstory, and endless wonderful hugging. Kane showed unexpected comedy chops, he really is the best, but it was Daniel Bryan that emerged as WWE's great unsung comedy powerhouse. And speaking of, number two, Daniel Bryan's obsessed with bears. Daniel Bryan is a mischievous little man, and while yes, he'll kick you so hard he'll change your eye color, there's nothing more wonderful than watching him try to make everyone who shares a promo with him corpse. On Talking Smackdown, he destroyed Renee Young by talking about Jay James Ellsworth's big hog. He ruined AJ Styles forever by outing him as a round earth skeptic. And on the JBL and Cole show, he set himself up as man of wrestling achievement, the Dazzler, aided by his sidekicks, Ninja Regal and Curly Kane. God, Kane's the best. But in terms of peak Brian, it's probably that episode of Saturday Morning Slam where Brian sat on commentary and spent almost the entire hour talking about bears. He loves bears. He wants beat a bear. He freaks out when Cesaro puts R-Truth in a bear hug. Daniel Bryan giving a shit is wonderful but Daniel Bryan not giving a shit is even better. And number one, Southpaw Regional Wrestling. Is there a petition I can sign to replace SmackDown with Southpaw Regional Wrestling? Now we all know that 80s territory spoof Southpaw is wonderful, but it does raise one heartbreaking issue. When you see Rusev, Fandango, Holy shit, John Cena as Lance Catamaran, Rusev, Gallows and Anderson, Rusev, Tyler Breeze, TJ Perkins, and Rusev. All these guys being naturally funny, inventive, showing their deep love for old school wrestling tradition, and then you see what WWE does with this bottomless pit of talent on a weekly basis. Then the laughter stops, but let that take nothing away from Southpaw Regional Wrestling, which handily beats anything either the attitude or ruthless aggression era has ever made in terms of sheer laughs alone. I'd say it's a pretty good time to binge watch it all one more time. Those are our 20 funniest moments from the WWE's modern era. Did we miss out on your favorite? Let us know about it in the comments. Why not give WrestleTalk a like and subscribe for more great lists and enough wrestling news to kill a bear. Jam that jam.